Well, as a matter of fact, that's a good entree into this week's <laughs> AEW Dynamite television program. Where, oh, where is Punk tonight? Why did he leave us here all alone? We searched the world over and thought we'd found a big star. He punched a buck and pfft, he was gone. Oh, boy. Oh, if punk coming back means less singing. Come back CM Punk. Well, tomorrow. then we get to hear Lack Mussolini. Oh. You know, that was the worst part of CM Punk's first run in AEW was your singing. I'll have you. That's know. how good a run it was. That was the worst part. People enjoyed it. People enjoyed it. The run and the singing. But no, it, the Cow Palace is 25% full, or another way to say that is 75% empty for a live national television program. And you can say, well, but they're in San Francisco for the pay per view. And then why are they in the same town the Wednesday before when the pay per view's not sold out yet? I understand. I told you this here yesterday. As I understand as a television production viewpoint, saving the the cost of the load in and load out, but they're not doing that because they're in different buildings. They're saving trance, but, but then how long do they have to put people up? Are they flying them back and forth? Or are they putting them up in San Francisco, California for a fucking week? Yeah, it's one thing if it's WrestleMania weekend and it's WWE running a bunch of shows where they have thousands of their fans in a town, you know they're going to be able to sell out more than likely NXT and the Hall of Fame and all these various things or even a SummerSlam weekend. But AEW has been doing this thing, not as egregious as here where it's multiple nights in this town and they didn't draw the first night, but where they were in Texas for weeks, they were in the Northeast for just, seemed like a month straight. Every show was within driving distance i mean it was kind of crazy and here they are at san francisco again it's not wrestlemania weekend and an aew revolution this year is not what aew revolution was last year and they're running all these shows <laughs> i mean thank god they're not running the pay-per-view in the cow powers the crowd they had for the tv would have looked a lot better in the building they're running the pay-per-view from well, uh, Cow Palace, and it, the, the problem with the Cow Palace also is the floor area is immense. So that sometimes even makes it look worse than it is. But nevertheless, um, as we will find out shortly, I know you're standing by with those ratings, aren't you? Last week's Rotten Show came home to roost in the ratings because we said, okay, what was the reason for the anomaly you couldn't really say yes they had no nba but they weren't against the nba the majority of the year the past three years this never happened like this what was, was it tony's announcement well if it was then that's going to kind of come back to bite him because the announcement fell flatter in a plate full of piss a new reality show when everybody wanted We've signed fucking, you know, goddamn Bruiser Brody or whatever. A signing, the video game, anything else yeah. except that. He didn't, he didn't even make the announcement. But the uh, point is, they kept the audience for the first time last week and did a good number. And we said, my God, sooner or later, the blind squirrel will find a nut. But Tony will take this because it was all his friends and key positions and the people that are nice to him. He will take this as a sign that he should do this every week, and that's what he did. And he he was interviewed this week. I don't know what it was, because I know he does a couple of regular spots in different places, and then he just interviews with seemingly anyone. But I read where he was talking about how he thought the rating was indicative of fans really getting into the stories, the stories all coming together, going uh, into the pay-per-view, and it's like, no. that's the exact opposite of what's happening right now. The stories all are terrible. Your booking is not good right now. And he looks for anything he can to justify his reasoning as opposed to maybe my reasoning isn't working. I need to find a different solution. And nobody close to him was willing to say, well, Tony, since this has never happened before, then shouldn't you find a reason other than that? That because you've had is he saying now, well, these are his best stories ever. And they've all come. This is his best talent ever. And it's all coming together. This is his best. What it? No, he's had better shit in the past. And they still didn't do the rating, keep the number, whatever the case. So instead of trying to potentially find out what it really was or whether it was random chance, 
or whether it was the announcement and then he let him down with the announcement or whatever, he uses that as, oh, they think they like me. They really like me. And then next week, they don't like you. They don't really like you. And he didn't learn anything. And we got more outlaw mud show, bad indie wrestling on television. Same start, too. It was like he doubled down yeah, on what happened I last called week. that one. Yeah. And you told me, you say, you know what, what else can you say? You said skip this one this week, because what else can you say about pockets? But for big bad Bill's sake, I wanted to see what the, and again, Tony is using anything he can to make himself right rather than to modify his behavior. So last week he put pockets on the fucking first match and kept the audience so now we got to see pockets open the show all the, but now somehow, you know, we're back to reality and people are seeing what they're seeing with pockets. I'm not, but I wanted to see how they were going to do this from the standpoint of, they put him against old big, bad bill. I know his name's big bill, but you got to put something in there and make it interesting. So I've added the bad and Stokely. Now that pockets is wrestling a seven foot fucking 300 pound Greg Allman. But how are they going to potentially make this feasible? Because in pockets is still a small, unimposing mousy figure of a human. So we've said before, I said a couple weeks ago, Bill's looking better. He had some facials. He had some fire, but this negated that while he was trying to stooge for the idiot and keep up with the rolling round, he had mono face, and also he was made to look like not only an idiot, but ineffectual, because he can't beat this fucking guy. The first two minutes of the match was pockets slowly and without any excitement whatsoever, working his gimmick, rolling away and bailing out, and it was, you know, the quarter of the house in the cow palace might have loved it, but it was death for a TV viewer. They weren't even touching and nobody was even chasing anybody. And finally, when the seven foot, 300 pound guy takes over, <laughs> did you see him miss his own stinger splash into the turnbuckles? Yes, I did. The pockets is in the corner. Big Bill runs at him, dives, pockets, doesn't move, and Big Bill goes right beside of him, and so I guess he was supposed to move, or he didn't get the memo. I don't know what the fuck's going on. And then they go to the floor for about a minute. I count, I've actually timed it. They're on the floor for a minute, and in slow motion, uh, Big Bill and Stokely set up a table but then Pockets fights back, but then Big Bill choke slams Pockets through the table onto the floor, and that's the break spot. <laughs> so they were on the floor for two minutes. There was no count out. The manager helps with a table spot. There's no disqualification. Then they go to the break, and in picture in picture, you see the idiot mascot on the floor for another 45 seconds. He's already been outside for two minutes by my watch. There's no count out. The doctor checks on him. There's no stoppage of the match. And when Big Bill throws him back in the ring, he doesn't even cover him. Since now he's got a chance to win, he throws him back out to the floor. And then when you come back from the break, Danhausen had come out to support Pockets, who still has a seven-foot guy hitting this little hatchet head with everything and can't beat him. Danhausen tries to curse Big Bill and Big Bill goes to choke slam him, but Stokely says, No, I want him. And Stokely backhands Danhausen with his cast. <laughs> this is going on while the match is still supposedly going on. And all this shit, why was this even necessary? What the fuck is happening? So then our little puppy pockets makes a 100-mile-per-hour comeback and hits dives on everybody like four or five minutes after he's been, not even after he's been choke slammed through a table by a seven-foot giant. And he hits some spinning things, and he hits Roman Reigns' finish three times in a row and beats the seven-foot guy one, two, three. 
And so, Big Bill, thank you for coming. Facials or not, you're feared by no one. You're looked at as a complete laughing stock. You're now completely useless on the roster. And the whole first quarter hour with the highest viewership, probably, and I think the ratings will, I don't know them yet quarter by quarter, but I bet it'll bear it out. The quarter with the highest viewership was a complete waste of time and leads to nothing and makes me want to buy nothing of the pay-per-view. What were your thoughts? I'll go back to what you said at the top. I told you to skip this. <laughs> I said, there's no reason for you to watch this. There's no value in it. Stokely is getting more and more, not comedic, but more and more silly just because you can't take him seriously. It'd be one thing if all of a sudden he was dressing like a Black Panther and you could take him seriously. He's a comedy character now on the show. Yeah, it's, it's well, if, if they made a Hogan's Heroes out of the Black Panthers, Stokely would fit right in at this point. Orange Cassidy beat Big Bill. I'm not surprised. I don't know if Big Bill could beat Riho at this point in AEW. <laughs> And I think I've talked about how cold I think Orange Cassidy really is. That doesn't mean that if you go into a hot place like Phoenix, they're not going to pop for everything. There are certain crowds that they're so happy the circus is in town, they're going to go ape shit for everything. But the people that have been watching regularly, the people that may be a little more jaded or cynical, whatever it may be, you've been watching this guy week after week, and then he would take breaks, and they'd bring him back on TV, and then week after week, and here we are. This current run where Tony mixes guys in and out, he's the All-Atlantic champion, a title that means nothing. <laughs> I'm not even talking about the fact that they have other flags on the belt. The title means nothing. Does the title mean anything in AEW? Until he defended the title last week on TV, if you closed your eyes and tried to imagine who the champion was, did you know it was Orange Cassidy? The title well, can, means nothing. Can, can, you, can you list all the champion, uh, the championships that they have and who has them? There were just belts all over the place, but that's a whole different story. But the point is Orange Cassidy, I said it, he's doink in 95. Came out last week. They had a big opening number, which they did a good job of maintaining throughout that show for whatever reason. This week, started the same way with the same guy that you started so many shows with. I think enough people are turned off or feel like they've seen the whole fucking thing with him. They don't need to see it anymore. But that's what I said last week. They've done this constantly. They start to show with him whatever. They always lose audience. Last week, they start to show they didn't lose with him. They didn't lose audience. If the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, when he did it umpteen times, he finally got a different result. And now he's going to keep doing it because it thinks it proved him right. Anyway, speaking of insanity, over and over, so we had the VTR promo of Moxley last week after the match. The match with whoever busted him open last week. It happens every week, so... But he got busted open. Oh, that was, that was Adam Page, old hangnail, with the barbed wire loop that he put around his fist. But it, they shot the promo right after the match. Moxley still covered in blood and engaging in his self-indulgent masturbatory fantasies that he's a badass and a tough guy and a horror movie villain and a hobgoblin, whatever the fuck. And they got lots of close-ups of the pool of blood developing at his feet. And hey, not only did this shit work in the territories because it... It, it it worked with the TV stations because it wasn't constant and overdone or done by people that were not over or not important or just people were sick of in the territories, but also the local TV station standards were easier back then in a lot of cases with the local programming and the company that you did business with every week and the promote they'd been there 15 years and people watched the show. And okay, and even then, the territory still got in TV trouble. Now, this is a national television operation with some kind of standards. And I guess they're impressed with this audience these days, but it ain't the Super Bowl audience, and it sure ain't what was watching wrestling 20 years ago. So, 
again, for a variety, I'm not against blood in wrestling. And I'm not against showing it, but the promo, it it would be good coming from a guy who looked like something. It didn't have the shitty garbage matches that don't make any sense. And if this didn't happen to him every fucking week, if it was shocking because it was a shocking occurrence instead of expected, if, again, this guy just wasn't into the whole violence because I'm so angry and bad and mean at the world or whatever the fuck. And he doesn't... Here's another thing. It's not like Moxley is fucking Abdullah the Butcher, this raging madman. He's been a babyface. Now he's a heel against Paige, but he doesn't cheat like a heel because he does the same thing all the time. He tries to go out and end people's careers with goofy stunts and furniture. He never pays attention to rules at all. So how do we know when he's cheating? I think this he's just convinced that he's the Sheik and Stone Cold Steve Austin rolled up into one and he's going to do this shit. A Texas death. They didn't even pop for the Texas death match in Texas. Because it was him and Paige involved in it. And not only are neither one of them from Texas, they probably don't give a fuck who wins this thing because they're both muddled baby faces that have suddenly one's turned without a turn. We didn't know the turn was coming until a turn happened. Then we thought, well, he's a fucking asshole lately, isn't he? What, what is happening here? I don't know. Uh, what I can't explain any of the AEW booking and what's going on on TV here. Moxley loves the bleed. He's going to do it no matter what. This was one of his better promos. And with that, it went too long. I feel like a lot of his best promos, it's like, all right, good. And then it goes another 30 <laughs> seconds or whatever. And he can't match that energy any longer. But it was an all right promo, but I'm not into the match. As far as Texas death, when you announce a stipulation that isn't clearly defined on a show where minutes earlier there was a Texas tornado match, <laughs> the fuck does the stipulation mean? It's just another stipulation match. How many stipulation matches have there been in the last month in AEW? So, and Well, and then they expected a pop in Texas for the Texas death match, and the last time they did a Texas death match, they didn't actually do a Texas death match. It was... One fall to a finish with no Texas death match. No rules at all because none of their matches have any. But it wasn't Texas death match rules and it was only one fall. So is that what they're going to do again? Maybe people, are, well, they didn't do it last time. Yeah. Hey, listen, it's a one-hour Iron Man match on the show. You better hope it's not Texas death match rules. Well, I was about to say, I don't <laughs> want to see either one of these fucking guys for 18 falls either. Don't get me wrong. But y why advertise shit when you don't deliver it? Well, you, you can especially when you can actually have the the match according to the rules of the match that everybody knows and is aware of. You don't have to change it. Just if you don't want to have that match, then don't book that match. Book a different match with different rules. Don't call it something different because that way you confuse people. Anyway, speaking of confusing people, you know, I got to admit that this is the best angle that Kenny and the Buckaroos have ever done on their television. This was, I think this was my favorite segment they have ever done. And I think they should do this every week because they've hit on a strategy here. Their music starts and everybody likes Kansas. So we get to hear some of Carry On My Wayward Son. And then, before they even have time to leave their posed positions in the entranceway, the lights go out, and when the lights come back on, there's the House of Black standing over all three of the EVPs, laying there in a puddle of piss, and the House of Black is holding the six-man tag team belts that nobody gives a shit about that were made so that Kenny and his friends could have some belts to play with. and. That took 30 seconds, and when this shocking incident happens, they follow it up by going to graphics to pitch the pay-per-view match, and out of that pitch, pitch a bunch of other matches, and when they come back, you see five seconds of the tail end of the cameras seeing 
people half-heartedly helping the EVPs back through the entryway and out of the arena, and that's the last we saw of them. That was genius. You know what I think about the lights out thing, so let's try to actually look at it in kayfabe. (laughs) Do these wrestlers telepathically have the ability to control the lights coming on and off, or is there, for a generation now, a heel lighting guy, or at least one in every promotion, that takes money on the side from these wrestlers, or he's aligned with them creatively or mentally? What in any way would cause this? It's just... It's the idea of getting a slight pop, but getting a reaction to something that in your head looks cool. But was it as effective as those guys standing there and House of Black runs out and kicks the shit out of them and leaves? I don't think so. Again, what you have in your head for the horror movie that no one's ever going to pay to see is different than what works for professional wrestling. So, no. Lights out, lights on. That's beyond lazy booking at this point. That's... You're a fucking idiot. Find something else. Well, but no, now they did it in ECW. And ECW is what they're trying to do here now. They did it in the ECW. Again, you know, every great once in a while, when they started doing this in the 90s, if there was a blackout and the lights came on and there was a shocking surprise or a debut or whatever, you'd kind of get by with it because everybody's caught up in the moment. But once that worked, and then Paul made it a point to have a surprise as a regular thing, and that popularized it with the Mark crowd. And then, you know, now uh, the lights just go out when they do, everywhere. Because that's a thing you do in wrestling, because these knuckleheads haven't been around long enough, know that, no, it doesn't have to be that way. But anytime I can only see these characters for 30 seconds i'll take it i enjoyed that angle with them better than anything else especially because of what we had for the next 25 minutes and you know the the, their match did create a lot of controversy online i'm not sure it's for what they wanted it for but even when they do something that We normally would say, well, God, at least they're coming to their senses. They do it in such a way that you can't praise it. We've been saying for months and months and months and by the years, Hobbs, Hobbs, you got a star there. Boy, you ought to be developing that. Wow, what potential. So they put Hobbs in a match where they not only put him over, but he gets a shot at a title, and they put him in the absolute worst possible match for a guy of his talents to spotlight them in any way correctly. What they do is they put him in a indie wrestler's wet dream match that the other one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fucking guys were just thrilled to be in, I'm sure, and none of them mean a goddamn thing. Except for old take a shit. Because the people are still into him, but okay, it's Sammy Guevara. And we know what we're going to see here because it's a ladder match. It's Action Andretti, who's already been mostly forgotten. It's Ortiz, who I'd forgotten he still worked there. It was a guy in a mask that was never identified till the match already started. His name is Commander, apparently. Our friend Take a Shit, Eddie Kingston, who's... Horse has left the barn a long time ago because now he's just floating around. I guess he's pissed too many people off. A.R. Fox and M.R. Wangs, his manager, and Powerhouse Hobbs in a ladder match. And whoever climbs the one of the multiple ladders and gets the golden hemorrhoid pillow will get a shot at the TNT title next week on television. Uh, again, look at those names, and I know Eddie Kingston is not a high flyer, but apparently, as we'll talk about in a second, they didn't give a shit whether he was in the match or not anyway, and maybe he said, I don't want to be in this fucking match. But otherwise, everybody else fits. Guevara, Andretti, the guy in the mask, uh, AR5, everybody fits. This is an indie wrestling fans, outlaw wrestler 
wet dream fantasy match. They can do all the shit with all the furniture and all the stunts. None of it makes a shit. None of it means anything. Nobody's going to remember it tomorrow, but they're going to take the video home and show their friends. So, without even any introduction, so everybody comes off like a job guy, the bell rings, and Kingston and Ortiz get in a fight on the floor, and the other guys start doing shit, but Kingston and Ortiz, well, Brian, you know what they did, don't you? I do. They just fought off. They just fought off. They got in a fight on the floor and they fought to the back and we never saw them again. And the announcer actually referred to him about midway through the match. Well, we understand they were pulled apart in the back. So was that a big angle that was expected to make us want to see a match between Kingston and Ortiz? Or was that just two guys that said, you know, fuck you. We don't want to be in this thing. We might hurt ourselves. What do you think? No, I think it's, uh, well, those two, you know, work together, but also they're doing something with Eddie Kingston that's an angle. Well, good. But anyway, everybody else got in a fight on the floor. There were two dives in the first 15 seconds. There's multiple ladders. There's a 10-foot ladder in the ring. There's a 15-foot ladder that comes in within the first two minutes. And, you know, again, Hobbs looks great in spots in a match like this when he's beating people up but he's in the ring with children and nobodies and it it looks bad when he's in this mess and it, they tried to turn him heel but the people were loving him here throwing people around because that's impressive and there's no reason to dislike him because they probably can't even remember how he turned heel and then you know, they, they do dives by the gymnasts, and the lucha guy walks the top rope corner to corner and dives on everybody. Why? Since everybody else was out on the floor, theoretically, you could have just got the ladder and won the fucking match, you stupid idiot. But instead, you do something fancy and jump on everybody and go out there on the floor where you can't win either. It, it went about six minutes, seemed like an hour, they went to the break. And they come back with more of the ladders. There's a ladder propped on the ladder, and they're doing a teeter-totter ladder balance with the ropes and the ladder in the ring and the ladder on the apron and on the barricade, and and they're taking bumps on them, and they're using chairs now in front of the referee because, of course, now ladder match, no DQ, lazy booking. Was Razor Ramon and Shawn Michaels a no disqualification match, the latter match at WrestleMania? I don't remember that stipulation being announced. I mean, there were no rules um, implied, no. but... It wasn't a no disqualification match because it didn't have to be because they weren't going... They already had a gimmick. We're not going to put a hat on a hat. They can use the ladder. The ladder's legal. So they still can't go out in the fucking crowd and grab a handgun out of some woman's purse and bring that in because that's not part of the match. And again, all the marks and the outlaws and the indie-minded goofs that have taken over not only this company, but all the companies, think that everything's no DQ if you've got a stipulation on a match that doesn't have anything to do with whether it ought to be no DQ or not. Because that's an excuse for the guys to take shortcuts and do shit that doesn't make any fucking sense. And that's all they want to do. And that's what this fucking was. And it was shit for 25 minutes on national television. Using chairs, no DQ. Then old Action Andretti tried to give the Falcon Arrow. What the fuck name is that? The Falcon Arrow to Sammy off a ladder onto a ladder, and they fell off and almost killed themselves. And it they take forever to do the fake-looking setups so they can take more ridiculous bumps. Then Daniel Garcia, the Rock's ex, just jumps in and joins the match and beats up Andretti and take a shit in front of the referees because it's no disqualification. Then why didn't you go out and hire a bunch of crackheads that need money to come and follow you in, and as soon as the bell rings, just have all the crackheads beat your op opponents up. So Garcia comes in and beats them up, and then 
So then they, 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 Garcia and Sammy put Action Andretti on the ladder, and Sammy climbs to the top of another ladder, and they're out on the floor, and he does the senton off onto Action on the ladder for no reason. Hurts them both. And the ladder ain't going to break because it's metal. There's no reason for do. While everybody else to match is laying around trying not to win, Sammy's got and and tell everybody he's crazy first by spinning his finger. Well, are you a baby face? You fucking grinning little goof. I've had enough of you too. While I'm thinking about it, you smarmy slappable faced idiot. Which one? You've, Sammy Guevara. He's oh. fucked up a number of goddamn positions where he was really popular and really over, and it wasn't just because of the booking being bad that he's not anymore and that he lost those spots as a baby face and a heel is because of his stupidity. And now he's a heel, but he still wants us to know that he's crazy. So we'll cheer for him when he does something cool because he's crazy, but he's supposed to be a heel. He don't know what he is. And he got trouble running his fucking dick liquor. He ought to shut his pie hole every once in a while and concentrate on trying to make money in this business instead of being a fucking stunt man. I'm about fed up with him too. So then Garcia pushes Sammy up the ladder. The guy that's not even in the match is pushing the guy that's in the match up the ladder, help, but then take a shit, pushes that over, and all they go over. And now take a shit's climbing, and the people want him to win. They're up for that. But Hobbs knocks him over with the ladder. And in the process, as take a shit falls sideways, takes the ladder over, it fucks up the ladder leg. Now, there, besides the fact that there is a good, taller ladder in the corner on the floor, just right in the corner of the ring there, <laughs> Hobbs starts climbing the bad ladder, and he t calls the referees and says, hold the ladder. And this started an entire controversy. And before we get to that, let me just say that at home, I'm sitting there thinking, well, he needs a bigger ladder. And he's the tallest guy in this fucking match. But they have different size ladders. I don't see how he's going to get what he needs to get using this ladder that's now broken on top of that. But the referees come in the ring, and they all squat down and hold the ladder while he starts climbing. Let's go into the controversy there. All of the people who have eyesight and common sense said well isn't this some kind of fucking flea market bullshit uh, the, besides the fact that the referees have to hold the thing isn't that showing favoritism by to one competitor helping somebody win by having to hold the ladder and bryce rimsberg one of the referees in question and i know bryce from ring of honor days Except now I've seen footage of him with the working with the Invisible Man. So Bryce, you can go fuck yourself too, you Invisible Man filating fucking imbecile. Bryce Remsburg <laughs> gets on Twitter and says, "Well, what's more important, looking like that it's predetermined or favoritism or helping a coworker stay safe, like they're doing fucking fire drills working at Target, my coworker." And, of course, the pussy AEW crowd that doesn't mind when wrestling looks fake because that's the way they think it's supposed to look because of the people that they like all look fake. They say, of course, it's more important to keep the wrestlers safe than it is to make this look real. And all the wrestling fans that think the opposite were saying the opposite. And they almost got to fist fights with each other on the goddamn, of course, you know, and I told Bryce what I thought. I said, well, here's the thing. Actually, your fucking idiot boss is booking things to get the wrestlers paralyzed, and your fucking idiot wrestlers are having matches to paralyze themselves, so why shouldn't you fucking help them? And we, we can, if you want to, we can discuss each point or all as a whole Yes, it does show favoritism, and yes, it does make it look like it's a bunch of hoo-ha when the referees have to assist people, and a lot of the WWF fans 
came in and said, well, it doesn't happen there. And then all the AEW fans found pictures of the WWE referees holding the ladders also. Apparently it does happen there too. And a lot of them would say, well, then you just don't mind it when it happens in the WWE. That's not my opinion. I mind it when it happens anywhere because I think it's equally stupid. I think it was stupid to have this fucking match. I think it was stupid to put anybody in it. I think Tony Khan has lost the fucking plot. But yes, all those things can be true. It makes the business look fucking hokey. It does look goddamn like the the referees are helping someone or showing favoritism. It just looks Bush League in general for a national television program. And since the fucking tallest guy in the match could not reach the thing anyway on this fucking ladder, it was stupid of them to be holding something that they figured probably wasn't going to work. And we can talk about all these things if you want. And I will say this in the interest of full disclosure, and Brian, you know this well. The first time I ever saw a referee hold a ladder was the same time as the first time you ever saw it. When Tracy Smothers and Chris Candido were having a ladder match in, where was it, Chilhowee, Virginia, or someplace. It wasn't Pikeville? Wasn't the Bluegrass Brawl? Was it, was it, no, they didn't have a, did they have a ladder? That was the next, yeah, okay, yes. Ladder match, Bluegrass, wherever the fuck it was. The point is, almost nobody had had ladder matches at that point. We only had one ladder because we didn't know that the ladder would break. We were the ladder's metal. There's been like, I've seen three ladder matches, all of them involving Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon. Two at a house show and one at the fucking pay-per-view. And so we had one ladder. And when they got to the finish, the leg on the ladder snapped. So Hildebrand held it so that they could do their deal. And then we went and got a backup ladder whenever we did that again. And so, yes, in that case, I was guilty also. But now that everybody can't stop doing ladder matches, even though nobody's clamoring to see more of them and none of them make any sense and the stipulation is just thrown onto people without any reasoning for it, they've got a dozen fucking ladders. And so, the, but this thing, it, it, the referees are holding the ladder. Hobbs, the tallest guy in the match, goes up and can't reach the hook to get the fucking hemorrhoid pillow off of the hook or the deal without going to the very top step. Now you've got a six foot, what, three or four, whatever he is, 275 pound guy standing on the very top step of a broken ladder in a wrestling ring being held by five measly little white boy referees. With his hands over his head. With his hands over his head. And now he's stuck when once he got the thing and the people cheered, now he realizes I cannot get down. And you saw it on his face. And he's look he doesn't know what to do. And you see him look down at the referees, hold this fucking thing. And he looks and he, and they're keeping a close up of him. So it just looks like he's looking at his dick. They didn't want to shoot the referees, but it, it he, he finally figured out a way to get a foot back onto the next level down where he could get some kind of balance. And when he got down to the second rung from the top where he could hold his hands out, the people gave him a round of applause for coming off the top of the ladder without killing himself. And then he's got relief on his face. So the guy they wanted to get over, they put in the worst kind of match to play to his strengths stink up a national television program for 25 minutes with every jack-off outlaw guy in the fucking business doing every jack-off outlaw spot in the business. As I said, every indie wrestler's wet dream. And then, without even giving him time to glorify in it, Samoa Joe's on commentary, who's also a heel. Samoa Joe and Hobbs start to argue but Wardlow comes out to yell at Samoa Joe and beats up eight security guards. And <laughs> by the time that's over with you, what the, f what are we even again? Who, how did we start here? Uh, but the big controversy on Twitter and on the internet was, should the referees have been allowed to hold the ladder or not? 
And the answer to the controversy is they shouldn't even been put in that position because this match was an embarrassment. Beyond that, the actual unhinging of whatever the giant gold, I guess a giant brass ring, I forgot that's how stupid this is, at the top of the thing, at no point earlier in the day did anyone set up the ladder and see if anyone could reach it. Because like you said, he was the tallest guy in the match. He had to go to the very top, put his hands above his head. He has, you know, give him credit. He must have great core strength. Good Lord. Because a lot of people, most people would have fallen off that fucking ladder. And after wrestling that match and not getting dizzy, looking up like that with both your feet together on a ladder in the middle of a fucking cavernous airplane hangar like building the vertigo i mean it, i mean afterwards it's amazing too. he did it he yeah. sh- he should have gone back and beat the teetotal shit out of everybody involved in setting that match up but they had a bigger ladder but then you've got a 275 pound guy trying to climb a 15 foot ladder like he works for the fucking telephone company or some roofer or something it's ridiculous just because you're a mark, a basement, what a neck bearded mark of the worst. Ca- you're not a wrestling fan. You're a mark. And you think that ladder matches are what people are interested in seeing on a mainstream base, regardless of who's in them and what they're for. That's the Tony has lost his fucking mind. He's lost the plot. And this television program, more than ever, Shows it. They need a star. They need a baby face. They need some business. They need all. They need punk. And they need some better wrestlers. And they need a fucking booker. And it was obvious with all of this at one time that, that those three things are, are very necessary at this point. And it can continue to fall to shit, or they can re- recognize that and address some of it. Go ahead. It feels like AEW, in a lot of ways, is reverting back to a lot of the things that we saw in the early days of the show. When the crowd was hot, when people were really into the idea of the alternative, they put so much garbage on the TV show and on the pay-per-views. The legless boy. Battle royals, endless ladder matches, and they get tag team battle royals. Just all of these things, people everywhere. They're doing it again on their show, and that's the thing. You can kind of compare this to what we've seen in the past. It's just not resonating the same way anymore. Well, that's good. It wasn't any good the first time around. It was a bunch of indie darlings that weren't ready for television, but the people thought they were, and they were excited at what was going to come, and boy, everything's going to be great. And now three years later, they're trying to shove either the same exact people or the same concept of shit, the fucking Peter Avalons of the world and the legless boys and the fucking, remember, Jelly Nutella was on national TV for some reason at some point. They're trying to do that again with talent that's not ready for national television, that doesn't look visually ready or is not ready experience-wise or in some cases never will be ready. But now it's not like, oh, it's a brand new company and we hope for great things. They've seen what they've got for the last three years. And it's starting to look like some of the shit they were seeing a year and two years ago is a lot better than what they're seeing right now. So they're not reacting to the same gags from these you know, comedy, cosplay, and nitwits that they were at the start. Because it's not all new and fresh, and it's exciting. It's now, oh, wait, we're going back to this again after we had some steak for a while? Hmm. You know what? It's, it's what you eat, Brian. It's what you eat. It's what you consume. It's what you get used to. It's what you put in your gut. There are a lot of these things, a lot of these analogies that we could draw, but it, it starts out with good gut health. I just if, I just said Powerhouse Hobbs must have incredible core strength. I got to think yes. to be up there. He's got guts, and he showed it. Boy, howdy, I'll tell you what he did. He's got the guts. And we're not talking blood and guts like Plumber Moxley. We're talking about good intestinal health. And we've talked about my colon, and we've talked about the way that people care for colons over in the United Kingdom. You can care for your own colon without having to have other people coming in and out bringing in equipment, possibly tracking up the carpet, 
making tracks in the mud, wherever that might be located. You don't want that kind of thing. You want to be able to do this yourself, yourself rather, or yourself. Stealthily. You want to be able to stealthily do it yourself so that no one knows that you're doing it. And the way you start with gut health, well, how, where do you start? Let me clarify this. Brian, did you know <laughs> that there are over 3.8 million posts on Instagram tagged hashtag gut health? Oh, no. Did you know that? I, I did not know that, no. Did you know that a staggering 653.7 million videos on TikTok or on gut health? I certainly didn't. How would I know that? I mean, where are we supposed I, uh, to be getting well, these facts? I'm, I'll tell you in a second. But did you know that a quick Google search will yield you over 29.7 million news results about gut health, probiotics, and the microbiome phenomenon that's taken over conversation, headlines, and hashtags around the country and around the world. Were you aware of this? I wasn't, That I've had so many conversations about microbiomes, so I don't know what I'm missing here. Well, that's because you haven't been talking to our friends over at Seed. See, I've gone to Seed, and I've talked to them, and I've asked them what's going on, because I really didn't understand it. I thought it was, it was all gibberish, and basically... That's the uh, the material and the information that they gave me. They said discoveries in microbiome research are transforming medicine and hygiene and diet and the choices we make each day for our health. And with this new frontier, however, comes an overload of information and misinformation that can feel confusing and overwhelming. And then they gave me a bunch of information that left me confused and overwhelmed. So I'll tell you what, folks, don't even try to figure this shit out. Your gut and your immune system and the microbiomes and the pathogenic antigens and the benign substances and the whole nine yard, you ain't gonna figure it out because you're just like me. You're just a layman. Hey, how often do you get laid, man? You're just a layman. You can't be expected to be conversant in all these highfalutin terms like intestinal permeability, which is also known as leaky gut, Ooh. and pathogenic microbes that promote dysbiosis. Also known Holy. as the elite. Also known as the elite. Every time I see them on my television, my stomach turns and churns. So therefore, what you're trying to do is you're trying to support your gut immune access or axis, your gut immune axis, not the axis. If you take care of the axis, nobody will access your gut. Otherwise, they got to come in the back way. What well, You, you got to prioritize your sleep. Yeah. You got to do that. Yes. Because your, your body, uh, it, 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 your changes to your normal sleep rhythms induce what is known as circadian misalignment. And circadian misalignment is when you collect those fucking locusts and you don't have them all lined up straight. Well, then it screws up all of your collection. Uh, you put them next to your butterflies. You C know, the cicadas? The, cic the cicadas. No, you're talking about a completely different thing, Jim. This is it's nothing to do with oh. seed or gut health. Well, also, Although some people to... do eat locusts, I guess. Well, you, you can eat them and some people think they taste like chicken. And you could also, you need to manage your stress. Because that's where you can increase your intestinal permeability, a.k.a. leaky gut. It can just bust loose. You'll be leaking everywhere. On the carpet, fucking floor mats, goddamn, if in the car. the, And, you know, it's hard to get that leaky gut smell out. And increase your daily fiber intake. And we've been talking about this. I've been eating more fiber and more farber. And I haven't had a chance to eat old Faber yet, but I'm working on him. But... Certain fibers are fermented by gut microbes and biotransformed into short-chain fatty acids, which help, helps maintain immune health and regulate anti-inflammatory and antioxidant responses. Do you want to learn any more about this? No, you don't. I do. You don't need to learn a goddamn thing. You need to learn who to trust. <laughs> and that's our friends at Seed. Because you could read this shit that they gave me from now till the cows come home. And you wouldn't know shit from apple butter about what they're talking about because they're smart people that have studied this 
and they have also got scientific proof and or scientists behind this. And many of the scientists have approved this of their own free will. It's only a few of them that their families are being held just because they got a little cranky. But the scientists are behind this stuff, and so are the doctors, at least the ones that they've compensated. And we can now tell you that you will have good gut health and a, 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 just a clean life all around, and your turds will smell better. If you go yeah, you to can't see, guarantee that. You can't guarantee that. Don't say that. Well, I, it's a pretty good assumption, though. You it's don't know that. It's not guaranteed. Well, I've from from what I've been sniffing around, finding out. If you're making assumptions about turds, you're making an ass of you and me about turds. Well, I've gone to several different places around town and smelled the bathrooms, and I'll tell you, there is a distinct difference. <laughs> How do you know who in the bathroom is using seed and who isn't? You wouldn't know. I'm dealing this shit part-time. <laughs> so anyway, right now you go to seed.com. That's S-E-E-D.com. Oh, what? <laughs> wild card. Wild card, bitches. <laughs> seed.com slash Jim and use the code Jim. That's J-I-M. My name to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com slash Jim. Use the code Jim. 20% off your first month of Seed's DS01 Daily Symbiotic. What are the ways it will help you? I don't know. I can't read all these big words, but I'll tell you what. They got doctors and scientists working on this stuff, and if you can't trust them, well, who the hell can you trust? So right now, start the Daily Symbiotic to help your gut and your health and your stomach in your digestion, and you won't leak rotten shit out your ass that'll ruin the upholstery of your car. Seed.com slash Jim. Use the code Jim, 20% off. Take this shit soon before it's too late. Well, speaking of going to Seed, let's pick up with Renee Moxley Good and see what she's doing this week on the program. She's in the back with the Puddin' Gang and Trent and Cupcake are both, or what's his name, not cut, Muffin Top, are both hurt. <laughs> you just went to a different pastry. Well, it, it, I, he's he's some kind of, I don't know, they're, uh, what, what's the cupcake or Muffin Top or croissant or whatever he is. He's hurt. They're hurt. They can't do the Battle Royal tonight. Scone. But Scone is hurt. But Danhausen volunteers himself, and, and now Pockets is sitting there. The doctor's checking him. He's being iced with ice bags. He's already wrestled, and Danhausen volunteers. Well, me and Pockets are best friends, so we can be in the Battle Royal. And Renee asks Pockets, are you okay? Can you wrestle? And he says, I don't care, and neither do we, and neither do we. <laughs> and again, if the ratings didn't already drop on the news of a potential second Pockets match, I believe they probably did there. And it keeps on coming because now Jericho's music hits. And he comes to the ring and we go to the break. I guess they thought, oh, Chris Jericho's coming to the ring. Let's see what's going to happen. Well, when we come back, pretty Peter Avalon. He's not very pretty, but he does look like a Peter. He's in the ring. Last week, he came out as a comedy spot and got knocked goofy and out cold with one Judas elbow so now they book a match between Jericho and a Jericho so you know this is Jericho's book to get TV time and he thinks because he sold for this fucking clown through the first two minutes of this three minute match that somehow that he's made this guy look like something before he beat him or whatever and he doesn't think that He's made people believe that. He actually got himself 10 minutes of television time to work with a job guy and indulge his Jericho appreciators to beat up somebody else that, you know, stands a chance of getting over. Well, so that's what happened. And the match starts. Avalon didn't even get a fucking entrance. And he opens with a flurry of fake children's punches that come nowhere near Chris Jericho. Did you see that? I saw what he was trying to do, yes. 
And then he, he can do a chop. He hit Jericho with some chops. Jericho bailed out at the floor. So pretty Peter did a dive. He can dive, but he can't punch. And to the floor. And here's the thing. Chris Jericho is selling for this clown. If you were going to do something like this, and I can tell you why they didn't do it before I even say this, because it wouldn't benefit Chris Jericho in total. It would benefit someone else. But you could have had somebody actually legitimate come out and try to answer the challenge last week and have Jericho wipe them out from behind and then make the match. And then people might have wanted to see it. But it was a clown spot with a job guy that's never used, never featured. If he does win, it's on YouTube somewhere. And who gives a fuck because he looks like a goddamn used condom. And you've got Chris Jericho, a former WWE champion out there selling for this fucking guy just so he can scratch up a few minutes of TV time to get his angle in. But meanwhile, Avalon again, could use a Cheerio for a hula hoop. He could tread water in a garden hose. If he gets sunburned, he looks like a thermometer. It turns sideways, stick his tongue out, he looks like a zipper. Needs to run around in the shower to get wet. He's so skinny without his belt, his upper body would fall through his asshole. I could go on. But so did this match. And he was getting two counts on Jericho and making funny faces. And then finally Jericho hits the code breaker, one, two, three, and pins him. And then gets a baseball bat. And then, Brian, anytime you hit somebody with a baseball bat, the way you want to do it is grab one end by the, the, the handle end in your right hand, and you want to cup the end of the baseball bat with your left hand. And you want to hit the guy on the point of the top of his head with it. Now, I used to do that sometimes with a tennis racket. If you want to get juice on somebody. But with a baseball bat in your hand, I believe you either need to just swing or don't use the fucking bat. Because what this did was go straight over the top of Avalon's head. It was obvious at regular speed, but in slow-mo, it was mind-blowing how far away the bat was from pretty Peter's head and pretty Peter takes a huge bump and referee Aubrey Edwards basically bails right after the three counts. So the guys in the ring beating the other guy up allegedly with the baseball bat, she's out there going, nay, don't do that. Nay, don't do that. And so then Jericho hits pretty Peter four more times with the bat. And each one of them looked, obviously, fake because he's hitting him as he's laying there. <laughs> he hits him on the arm. So then Avalon raises the arm that just got hit with a baseball bat to beg, don't hit me again. <laughs> oh, my God. So then the music plays, here comes Ricky Starks. And this was what Jericho wanted all along when he pitched this thing, besides being indulgent with himself was Jericho starts cutting a promo on Starks just because the Jericho appreciators aren't allowed Sunday doesn't mean they're not here tonight. And then, of course, Hager and Garcia jump fucking Starks and they hold Starks so that Jericho gets the bat and then drops the bat to run over and hit fucking Starks with his Judas elbow that sometimes he hits, sometimes he doesn't. I guess he wanted to prove he could do it. So he dropped the bat to hit him with the elbow. Nobody came out and helped. A couple of referees came out and started pointing, and the heels left with their music when they were tired of committing crimes. Did I encapsulate that segment approximately correctly? I think so. I mean, when we said, look at what he's doing to Ricky Starks, the Jericho defenders would say, he's elevating Ricky Starks, and look at also what he's doing for Action Andretti. Here we are a couple months later. Has anyone come out of this for the better? You know, a lot of people, I think, misinterpret my thoughts about Jericho. I don't think, like, he's someone I never want to see on my TV. He's useless. I only feel that about him acting out his own scripts. 
I think Chris Jericho has star power. I think Chris Jericho, when motivated, does great stuff. I think Chris Jericho is filled with horrible ideas. And the problem is, he's been allowed to run wild with all of his ideas. There are lots of people who were big stars in wrestling history who creatively couldn't cut it. It's not that they didn't have any ideas. They had some ideas. It's just they weren't good. Lots of ideas. It's just they weren't good. Well, some are good and some are bad, and they don't know which are which. I just, I mean, this is exactly, I mean, I don't know what to say anymore. This is exactly what we said was going to happen when he started working with Ricky Starks. Starks would mean less. It would be endless. For no good reason, it would be endless. And then we get stuff like this. The Action Andretti thing, which went nowhere. The guy hasn't even been on the show in weeks until he was in this ladder match where he almost broke his leg, it looked like, when he fell off the ladder onto another ladder. <laughs> So, I mean, what, what is... Oh, Jer- he didn't fall. He was pushed. <laughs> you know, what is Jericho doing? I mean, seriously, where's the value right now? Uh, well, speaking of great value performers, we have uh, the discount Kmart version of Stan Hansen, their own cowboy, Hangnail Page, who did a pre-tape with fairly rotten audio. Was Was he in a barn or was he under an overpass out in the back of the building somewhere it could have gone either way but he's talking about moxley and the texas death match and he says i don't enjoy violence i hate it i hate it to its core what the fuck what cowboy ever i hate violence i hate it to its core this fucking pissy nerdish drooling, mush mouth, wannabe cowboy from just because he lives in Virginia where trees are doesn't mean he's the second coming of cowboy Bob Ellis for fuck's sake. And it this was every indie wrestler's pretend classic promo. It doesn't really connect with anybody. It, it doesn't give you the impression that this guy is real speaking from the heart and that he's a real cowboy or a real anything else, it makes him think that he sounds dramatic for the marks that are already going to enjoy whatever he does anyway. But the wrestling fans know this guy's horseshit. And he doesn't smell like horseshit because he's a cowboy. He's horseshit because he's phony. He's another one. He gets his feelings hurt, and he don't want to listen. Well, I didn't want to listen to this, but I did, and it didn't speak to me very much. And we now know that he hates violence to its core, so that's he's going to be in the Texas death match. Do you think Renee Moxley Good thinks that she's Diane Sawyer or Barbara Walters, or why she keep being put in these positions where she asks the hard questions like, what's up with that? Uh, but she was in the ring with Christian Cage. And again, the professionalism level shoots through the roof. Remember, there was a time about, what, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, when they let Christian speak on television for several weeks in a row as a heel? And we said, well, well, this is just great. I think that was the start of this current angle with Jungle Boy about two years ago, right? Well, he wasn't a heel then, but yeah, he started the thing with Jungle Boy a few years ago. I think a year ago is when he turned heel, approximately. Well, the, for a few years, or a few years, for a few weeks, he was doing good heel promos, and then suddenly that stopped happening. Well, now out he, here he is again. He's knocking the town. He's subtly adjusting Renee's microphone holding, because here's a guy that actually knows how to do an in-ring interview and let the interviewer hold the microphone. And he even knows how to surreptitiously coach the interviewer on where to hold the fucking microphone. And the only unfortunate thing about this was he's still talking about Jungle Boy, but what, at least we're hearing Christian. And he gets heat, and he looks like a villain, and he has the demeanor and the attitude, and the he doesn't, he doesn't put it over or get rattled when the fans chant, shut the fuck up. He goes on because he's got great delivery and inflection. And, you know, he looks down his nose at people with that heelish demeanor. And he said, 
Jack, Jungle Boy Jack, you treat my business like a video game. I treat my business like an ATM machine. That was a great. And then, of course, he challenges Jungle Boy for a no rules fight at the pay per view. As opposed to what other fights do they have with any rules? <sighs> but then, as he dug into Jungle Boy's father and he was really cooking, and I was liking this, the lights go out and the tape comes on the screen of Jungle Boy digging a, a grave, as we came to find out, is the shot of him digging a hole, and he's crying. And you see the the angle flashed before the, uh, the, uh, the highlights of the angle where Christian's done this to him and that to him. And then it pans out and you see a tombstone with Christian Cage's name on it. And Jungle Boy never spoke a word, which is probably the best thing for him. Uh, but then that was that was pretty much it. There was uh, Christian just got interrupted. The promo was great by Christian Cage. I like the idea of digging a grave and the tombstone with the name on it, the whole thing. But does any is anybody scared of Jungle Boy? Is he not already proven to? I mean, either by the booking or just by himself being himself. Yes, he's a feisty underdog, but his main event days. That ain't going to happen anymore. He's reached his ceiling on promo. He has good matches with guys that can lead him, but then he goes right back to the trampoline shit when he gets in with his friends. He has no bass in his voice. You know, wh what do you think? Eh, can we get this done with so we can see Christian do something else? I just don't want to see any more of this. Well, speaking of not seeing any more of this, I bet you I know we're not going to see a rematch between Matt Hardy and Hook anytime in the near future. How did they think this was going to... Besides the fact that it's the go-home show for the pay-per-view that they've got in the same town, and they decide to put a match for the FTW title. Remember Hook's father's belt that he is allowed to be used? that they still have not explained why it would be recognized in this company, but it's another belt and it's purdy and Tony likes those shiny things. But who thought that hook versus Matt for either guy hook versus Matt Hardy was not going to be a clash of styles was going to be a good idea to do on television live. I, 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 and that was their 9 o'clock entrance. Matt Hardy, at this day and age, go ahead. It's better than what I feared it was going to be. When I heard that music, I was afraid Jeff was going to run out there. I forgot that this was the match. I was just, I heard the music. I was like, oh my God, Jeff Hardy's about to run out there. But then it was Matt and this thing. I'm, I'm not even knocking either guy at this point, but Hook's size illusion is gone because Matt looks like Lex Luger next to Hook. The guys that he's been working with that can take all of his throws and and everything have either been very thin or Matt Hardy's goddamn gaining a lot of weight, but the size illusion is gone. Uh, within seconds page, cause the other page is out at ringside with Stokely and Lee Moriarty and they've stopped hook and got heat. And, but uh, started heat rather, but suddenly within seconds after that, Hook just picked Matt up and suplexed him and threw some punches, but then Matt just stopped him. And it got awkward because, again, Hook is green, and now we know that. They've kept it short and with people that could take his throws and he could do these things with. I'm not saying Matt Hardy can't work, but Matt Hardy can't do that shit. And Hook can't do the other shit yet because we know that now because he tried. It got awkward. They got off footwork. They had a double knockout. Then both were down. And then Stokely, who knocked out whoever it was earlier in the show with his cast, Stokely takes his cast off and gives it to the other page, who then hits, barely hits Hook in the head with it. And they use that as a false finish for a two count in this rotten match that is not going well, 
And it's not that I think, well, Stokely should have kept the cast on because his arm's broken. No, that's the whole idea is the manager's crying over a fake broken arm. Why did he have to take the cast off and hand it to somebody else? Why did they need to, after they've established the cast in Seg 2, why did they need to kill the cast in Seg 7? Now this guy got hit with it for a two count. What the fuck? And then Matt went for the twist of fate. And Hook went behind him and got the choke, and Matt tapped immediately before he'd ever even left his feet. And it... Awkward! Anything else you want to cast light on, I don't know what to say. Maybe we understand a little better why Hook has been mostly kept a rampage, it seems like. Well, but no, he's looked good with what they've done with him so far, which is... (laughs) Again, put him with somebody who can take his throws on and who Rampage. doesn't make him look like a child. He's done it on Dynamite, too. But this is the first time he's had a singles match on Dynamite in, I think, a while. This is who they put him in there with? Again, if yes. you're the booker, if you're the matchmaker, whatever, how would you think this would end up being a good match in any way? If you close your eyes and think of this match, how could you think this would end up being Okay. Because, well, I can tell you, because the difference between a Mark Booker and a professional Booker is a Mark Booker writes guys' names down against each other and imagines the match he wants them to have. Whereas a professional Booker, when he writes two guys' names down against each other, he can envision the match that they're actually going to have. And then decide whether he wants to see that or not. And there's a big difference in guys having the match you think that you want them to have and guys having the match that they will actually have. And you need to be able to figure out that difference. But then the House of Black were in the dark with the belts and rattled off a bunch of nonsense. And I wish they would put Julia Hart with anybody else so we could like her. Are we now being led to believe that this spooky place where they do their promos is just backstage? Well, it must be, because they were out there just a little the while belts. ago. Yeah, I mean, the fact they had the belts with them, unless they ran to a studio that they had nearby or a truck, that means they're filming all their spooky things with the smoke just in one of the rooms backstage. Yeah, well, it seems like then if that was the case, that all that uh, Kenny and the buckaroos would have had to do would be to look Storm in the, the dressing room with room? smoke coming under the fucking... and then just bust into that door <laughs> and take their belts back. Yeah, it works out well for them when they do that. Absolutely. And they'd have practice by now, so maybe they wouldn't go in all a flutter and get taken down. Anyway. Julia could sit on the couch and hold the dog. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But no, the dog's in the next match because it was Tony Storm versus Riho. Oh, be nice. nice. She's back. No, I'm going to be nice to Riho this week. Because it's not her fault. And we kid her and we joke and et cetera. And it is embarrassing to look at her on a wrestling program, but it's not her fault. This is the contribution that O'Kenny has made. The go-home television show on TBS cable for a pay-per-view, and we're looking at a buck-toothed 90-pound girl that they've convinced that she's a wrestler. It's not her fault. It's not her fault that she looks like the poor, timid, mousy little Talia Shire character if she was from Tokyo running that pet store. What has happened here is the influence of Twinkle Toes. Because him, and uh, they've got a weird cultural thing in Japan over little girls in frilly outfits singing or trying to be wrestlers or whatever it else it is that they have them do over there. Right. And Kenny, who we've established as the world's preeminent basement dwelling weeb. And the rest of the, anybody can play crowd that hangs around with him have convinced this girl and others like her. Over there with the, the the children that get trained so they can have sweaty, supposed adult men gripping them in various parts of their bodies. They've convinced this girl 
and others like her that she is a wrestler. She can be a wrestler. She should be a wrestler. And he truly believes somehow, either that or it was just a ploy to get her over to his house, but he truly believes that this nonsense will somehow get over on any reputable level to make any kind of money in the United States of America or anywhere else outside Japan. Because he's supposedly a wrestler, she believes him. It's not her fault, it's his and others like him putting the idea in this girl's head that she should do this. Because everybody can play. And also because of the weird fetish fucking situation that nobody but me is willing to fucking bring up. And go, what is the other reasoning or impetus or motivation to put this little small mousy 90 pound girl in a professional wrestling ring and allow her to do wrestling moves to nobody's entertainment except Kenny and the fucking weirdos that get into the weird shit that he gets into and at least they won't actually let him wrestle these women here on television like he does in Japan even when they're nine years old but he still has the power to put this shit on our television because Tony's an idiot. So this took however many minutes of TV time, including a break, made Tony Storm look like shit that she's got to sell for this. And then Britt Baker distracts Tony Storm and Riho wins again. The, it did what enough of two years ago. She's the women's champ. That's why the women's roster has been dreck since the start. Because it got off on that foot. And then Baker and Hayter fight Storm and Soraya, which was pathetic, and Riho disappeared. And then Ruby Soho ran in and beat up Soraya and Hayter, who were on two different fucking sides. And then the security and the referees come in for a pull apart. Now, when Chris Jericho was beating a man up with a baseball bat 20 minutes ago, nobody fucking showed up to do a goddamn thing. But when girls are fighting, there was 11 men in there trying to break them up. Yeah. I'm going to look at it the other way. I'm going to attack the booking once again. Rio is their first champion. Riho, despite people like you and me, although I don't have the problem that you have with her, I do think it's ridiculous. And we've said things, and other fans have thought the same thing, and AEW went with her. And a lot of their fans seemed to like her. And then she lost the belt, and she disappeared, and who knows, maybe there were days she couldn't get out of Kenny's place in Florida, who knows? But... Gets fogged in there a lot. We haven't seen her on TV in as long as I can remember. You mean to tell me your first women's champion, who you would think would be a big star, former world champion, just randomly shows up on your show with a couple of days, oh, here she is. She was on here, she was on Rampage, she had a big match with Emi Sakura. Oh, huge. Even I'm not a fan of the AEW women's division, even if you are. This is how you use Rio? She just shows up the week of the pay-per-view? When she's not even on the pay-per-view? <clears throat> to pin Tony Storm? Uh, well, she might be. She might say, well, Tony, can I be on the paper? Of course you can be on I the paper. I don't know if she's allowed to talk directly to Tony. She may have to go through Kenny. Her name is Riho, and she don't weigh 90 pounds. All right, coming up next, Keith Lee and Dustin Rhodes. What a tag team. I guess they're going to do something on a Friday show that nobody watches, but what the fuck is with Keith Lee and his whisper singing? It was even more prominent here, it's almost like, it, it, well, he came out and said in an interview, not on television, but an actual legitimate interview, that the WWE didn't like his promos. I obviously understand why, and it's almost like he's trying to do more of the shit that they didn't like to spite them, and it sounds ridiculous. Just fucking ridiculous. What did he say here, or do you remember? I don't remember much, but I did watch the match on Rampage, because as we are recording, that aired. 
last night, and I decided because it was live, I was going to try to watch some of it. I couldn't watch the whole thing. They chased me off. But there were different things I saw. Keith Lee, and I actually think this works for him, no longer using hair dye. So the very what? closely cropped hair he has on his head is now gray. What? And the facial hair is I didn't gray. know how old is he. I don't know. I mean, maybe. Wait, didn't we say he's late 30s? There are people who, I knew a kid who went gray in his early 20s. Well, but he, he shouldn't have spent that night in the haunted house. But, <laughs> but well, what the, does it, okay, so now he looks better because he's gray headed? It just looks more, I don't know, it looks more real, I guess. I don't know why he all well, of a sudden yeah. is Boy, like, look at that. Look at that real guy over on wrestling. He's he's fat and he's gray headed and he well, talks like Frazier Crane, but boy, I I believe he's real. Well, you forget that he's also now walking out to the ring like a druid. He has a giant robe on, but let's get oh, past boy. that. I watched some of that match. It was Dustin and Keith Lee versus Swerve and Parker. You gotta see how bad Parker is in the ring. This guy is not anywhere near ready uh. to be on a live television show. Swerve. Swerve had that big segment with Rick Ross, which was a joke. But Future legend. Young legend. Well, they gave it a lot of time. The segment was a legend. They gave it a lot of time on there. Apparently, Swerve, we had heard and we had seen in the results, is someone that, for whatever reason, his segments moved the ratings up. Since that Rick Ross thing, how many times has he actually been on Dynamite? How many times has Keith Lee been on Dynamite? Rick Ross, I know the answer. He hasn't been on anything again. Has anything been followed up on the program where anything happened? And this is an example of a lot of things in AEW. Something happens on Dynamite, and we're supposed to follow it even when it stops happening on the show it happened on. Or something happens on some other show they have, either Rampage, which no one watches, or the YouTube stuff. And we're supposed to know what it is by the time it gets mentioned on TV. It doesn't make any sense. This Swerve and Keith Lee stuff, you have no idea what was going on here. This was one of the biggest things on their show like a month ago, a month and a half ago. Yeah, it was a big motherfucker. They were the World Tag Team Champions. They broke up. Have we had a singles match? Of course not. <sighs> well, but we've got a 10-team... I guess there were 10 teams. I quit counting. Casino Battle Royal, just like last week, we had a tag team battle royal. Now we've got a casino tag team battle royal. And instead of all starting at the same time, they're going to come in intermittently because there was no rhyme or reason to the time. Some of them were three minutes plus commercial breaks. Some of them were a minute and a half because they did the spot early. It was just a bunch of shit being run in. but. They started this match on this program with Claudio and O'Wheeler Useless attacking the Dork Order in the Owlway. So again, now, you know, the BBC switched heel because of Moxley without really doing anything, and now they're just attacking other baby faces. And they get in a four-way fight, and we go to the break. And then they come back from the break, and those two teams are still fighting in the ring but within 10 seconds here comes rush and preston vance remember him and it already got sloppy and poor claudio remember we wow you know claudio may finally go to a place where they'll he's a great worker and a great guy if somebody needs to be used just because they're a nice guy he's so accomplished and so believable and he's strong and he's got size and so now he's just the guy in the group you never hear speak and he's, the Ring he's of in Honor multiple World man matches. Isn't he the Ring of Honor world champion? Is he? That's the point. I forgot. Yeah. Well, he's the invisible man on this program, but Penthouse and Felix came in, did a choreographed comeback. The announcer started talking about Cal Palace history and Tony mentioned Pepper Gomez like he was speaking Swahili and had never heard the name before. Somebody fed him the name Pepper Gomez. Um, Shivani's just, awful. He shouldn't be on commentary. Well, but no, but I mean... Is, is, More people I need to be thought, saying it because everyone knows it. I would have thought certainly Tony would have known who Pepper Gomez was, but they what were What the hell does he about, know about San Francisco wrestling history, Tony Shivani? Well, he should. 
Uh, but they were talking about as they Ray Stevens and Roy Shire and the glory days of big time wrestling in the cow palace. I'm thinking, and my God, every single one of those people now would hit the ring with a fucking stick after you people. So Ozzy Oldham was the next team in and now it was crowded and sloppy. Uh, the BBC dumped the dorks. They went through another break. They come back within 10 seconds. There's top flight. So we get some cheerleading and tumbling. And then I read Daddy Mac from the Jericho appreciators got dumped. And then I realized he and cool hand Luke were in this. And then here came Matt Taven and Mike Bennett with Maria Canellis, the best tag team in wrestling that we never see. They look great. She looks great. They can both work. They look like athletes. They've got physiques and they came in and looked great for 30 seconds and then got stopped by the Aussies with German suplexes in a battle royal. Even Taz mentioned kind of joking, you know, chuckling at their greenness that, well, you don't see that often. That's kind of dangerous. And you don't German suplex people in a battle royal in a room full or ring full of fucking people. You break somebody's leg. Uh, but then Arya Davari and Tony Nese and Josh Woods and Mark Sterling, none of whom are in this match, attacked Felix and Penthouse with incredible amounts of fake punches and dangerous bumps on the floor. So they're determined to hurt each other while not hurting each other at the same time. The punches came nowhere near and were fucking embarrassing, but they really took bumps on the floor that could hurt themselves. And then they threw him back in the ring and left. So then Rush picked Felix up and threw him out. And the referees were watching all this. Why didn't they do anything? Battle Royal. No disqualification. Lazy booking. No rules. That's why people get disgusted. That's why people scoff at wrestling. Because there is no... They're in these modern situations. There are no rules. Anybody can do anything, and if a person's not predisposed to be a fan of wrestling, they can pick all this shit out just like we can and say, look at that, that's why it's a bunch of shit. Who gives a shit? How could this ever happen? Because they're not smart enough to think of ways to get where they want to go without just doing stupid shit. So speaking of stupid shit, Vance jumped over the top rope and eliminated himself. Another guy ducked. He was still about 10 feet away, but he just kept going. And then it's been forever while they did all this stuff and no teams have come in, so I thought we were done, but then no. Music plays and it's Dan Housen and Pockets. And they get in and <clears throat> do nothing. And then the butcher and the baker are out after about a minute, not even. So somebody's loose with the stopwatch. And then, again, the best tag team in this match, Bennett and Taven, that you never get to see on television. They had 30 seconds of shine when they got in, then they both accidentally super kick Maria and get eliminated at the same time. So we, we get 30 seconds of them. We never see them on TV to begin with. They fuck up, the manager gets bumped, and they lose. Jesus H. fucking Christ. Then there was some more bullshit with the amateurs and the indie darlings, and it got down to Butcher and Baker and Pockets and Danhausen. So now, again, how much bigger of a joke can this be for a tag team title match? And the guns come out stage to watch them. And then Danhausen comes up from behind Butcher and Baker when they've got Pockets and dump them. So Pockets and Danhausen win this thing. So now the pay-per-view match is a joke for their top tag team title of several. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, here comes Lethal and Jarrett, and they attack Pockets and Danhausen and beat them up, but the acclaimed hit the ring and run Jeff and Jay off. And this was 25 minutes of TV time to stink the joint out and make a joke out of the tag team title match. And I, I don't know what to fucking say again, again. They need talent. They need stars. They need continuity. They need booking. And this, even Punk, 
Punk was great for having the top segment and anything he was in made sense and he had apparently some influence but a lot of the rest of the shows was still bad even with him so yes they need a top baby face which everybody including uncle dave has said and they need star power and they need good programming but is is he's only one man yeah is he allowed to staff each division I mean, that's well, the issue. We I, prefer even... those, I prefer the Young Bucks book tag team division than whatever we've been getting for the last few months. And boy, that's a kick in the pants. Seriously. And I like the acclaimed. And I was happy when they got over. And that match in Chicago, we will all remember. But since that time, FTR has been out of the division. The Bucks are out of the division. When the Bucks booked the division, at least they were... I don't know. The teams weren't jerk-off, complete jerk-off teams like right now. What was this match? And the end result is Danhausen and Orange Cassidy. This is a horrible tag team division right now. Even if FTR were there, who are they supposed to work with? Well, that's what I'm saying. You get, if, even if you get down on your knees and give him whatever he needs to come back and eliminate the problem with star power to punk, you still need FTR. You still need some new quality talent and you need to get a lot of these weeds away so you could see them if they're there because some of them are there bennett and Taven, we haven't seen dick of them nothing but we but we're looking at these fucking miscellaneous luchadors and goofy masked people and the goddamn house of black every time we turn around uh, anyway to close this program up, and then we'll look at the ratings and determine what's gone on. They had been building all night to, you know, MJF and Danielson. We're going to hear from Danielson. They did a package on MJF and Danielson leading up to the title match. And <sighs> this is sometimes the highlight of the WWE programming. But uh, honest to God, I mean, yes, Sockface was a talking head and he looks ridiculous and brings the whole thing down to an indie level. But I don't know, besides the fact they had nice footage of Danielson in the mountains, as I'm watching this package and hearing it from their own lips, I don't know that this whole story between these two guys has clicked and that that's what I've been saying for weeks. It not only has the story not clicked, I don't think they've clicked. And I don't think this, I don't think this has worked for Danielson. Danielson coming out there acting like a little bully on the mic, I believed. Whatever's been going on with Danielson for the last several months, and including, and especially with the MJF feud, has not clicked at all. This is not the way to use him, and this has not worked. And, and, he's, and really, he's not good in it. He hasn't been. We have to say that. Ryan Danielson has not been good in the outside of the ring stuff to elevate this feud. It's been all MJF, and maybe that's why he's overdoing it at times with some of the things he's talking about. Yeah. And there's no story that the story doesn't really click with you because, oh, wait a minute. MJF hates Danielson. One of the lines that was, I hate you because you've had more concussions than anybody else in my sport. But you're still here. I don't... Uh, Why would you hate him for that? I, uh, I know it's there somewhere, but it hasn't come out. It's, it's too... It's too cloudy or whatever. It's not clear. Magic 8-Ball says, try again. I don't fucking know. But this... it uh, They booked a match that the absolute markiest mark audio not the fans i don't call all fans marks i call the people that buy the trampoline shit marks and the people that book for the people who like the trampoline shit they booked a match that the trampoline gang will love oh they've got to go 60 minutes and most falls and it's iron man and it'll be so technically brilliant with danielson and blah blah blah, blah. you got to sell the goddamn thing first instead of putting together <laughs> a mark stipulation that the markiest of marks will want to see. This should have been highly personal with MJF not 
doing the baby faces work for him for him and taking heat off himself with talking about how he got broke up with his girlfriend. He ought to be talking about how he's got three of them and none of them know the other one exists, and he's fucking them all. The way you get normal men to be jealous of you instead of people whose pussy is not a fucking option to begin with. It just, I don't know. But anyway, after the foot, after the package, they went to the break with eight minutes left in the show. They've got to do a three-minute commercial break, come back with five minutes left, and we're, we're going to hang around for this big happening that they only gave five minutes to? And when they come back, Danielson's already in, entering the ring because you can tell they were running late. And Renee's inter introducing him while he's on the fly. And he's got his own microphone because, again, I hate to say it, but Brian is one of the modern group that thinks he should be in there emoting with his own microphone instead of being interviewed by the network sports analyst. But nevertheless, they're calling Renee Moxley good a sports analyst. So I digress. He starts his promo and MJF music plays and MJF comes out and Danielson says, shut up. And then goes off on MJF and all the reasons supposedly that MJF hates him. But now at least he brought a little clarity to that in saying, you hate that I have these things and you don't because I've earned them and you've done nothing to earn them. At the last minute, he's trying to speak to, normal, logical adult people who don't haven't understood what the fuck's going on up till now. And he did a nice tell-off of MJF, and, Brian, and MJF for once just stood there and took it, and then right as Danielson spoke his last word, my DVR froze because it was fucking 10 o'clock. Time to go. And they went. But that was the go-home... E, this is going to be an interesting situation this weekend that we're going to be covering on the drive-thru in terms of this one-hour match. And it's a one-hour yeah. match. What has led you to want to see these two guys? Maybe it'll be a classic. I hope it is. And they're both excellent in the ring. Maybe it will be. But in terms of the week-to-week buildup, in terms of this feud, there's nothing that is set up a desire to see these guys in a one-hour Iron Man match. I want to see them have a match, kick the shit out of each other for 12 minutes, because it seems like they both have some kind of anger issue directed yes. at the other one. But Animosity. A one, but a one-hour Iron Man match? What has been done in this to make the audience want to see that? And uh, uh, some people are going to say, well, what was it about the NWA world title that all those bookers booked one hour draws. The answer was simple. It was a match that was advertised as a match. It wasn't advertised as a match that had to go a certain amount of time or that there was whatever the case. And the deal was, and I'm going to give you an example in a second of modern day, but the deal was that when the traveling champion came to a territory, you didn't want him in most cases to beat your top baby face. And if you, if he did beat the top baby face, chances are it would be with a fuck finish of some kind, holding the tights or some illegal means to give the baby face an out because he had to come back the next week. The champion was off to another place. And sometimes the champion, yes, especially during the Sam Muchnick days would win, especially win in the end. But if you wanted to get multiple matches out of it, you would do a draw so they could come back with a 90-minute time limit, or you would do a draw just so the babyface wasn't embarrassed by being beaten or even fucked in his hometown, the fans thought, well, the next time maybe he could really beat the champion because the champion couldn't beat him this time, that type of thing. But this is the our Broadway NWA title match got romanticized by the modern wrestlers as some kind of badge of honor of being able to do that. There were NWA champions you didn't necessarily want to see go 60 minutes, but they had to, but it would have been better if they hadn't. Well, now these days you don't have to. There's more options. But the romantization amongst the wrestlers and the 
really hardcore fans of they went an hour. It's like a rite of passage. And they've come up with the different ways to do it. But again, sometimes you have an arena that or a match that needs a stadium. Sometimes you have a stadium that needs a match. And and a lot of times these days, instead of a match that needs a stipulation, you got a stipulation that needs a match. Figure the stipulation first and put the match together. And that's backwards. And I think that back in 2009, in Ring of Honor, when Adam Pierce was the booker, I think it was it was Tyler Black and Austin Aries. And he said, whatever they had done, he didn't want to switch the belt, but he didn't want to beat. I think at the time, Aries was, no, Black was champion and Aries was challenging, I believe. He didn't want to switch the title. He didn't want to beat either guy right then. It was Christmas final battle in New York. And uh, he's... He asked me, he said, what do you think? Can can they, should we do an hour Broadway? I said, well, can they go an hour Broadway? And it was Tyler Black and Austin Aries to say what you want about Aries, but he was a good performer. He said, I think they can do it. I said, well, then my advice is do it then. If you don't want to switch the belt, you don't want to beat the other guy. Yes, do an hour Broadway, but make sure that everybody on the card knows that you're doing an hour at the end so they don't go out there and go all night like they do a lot of times because then the New York fans especially will turn on the goddamn match because they've been there for too long already and they want to get to the meat of the matter. So keep the undercard matches short. Well, guess what happened? Not only did they not the undercard matches not listen to Adam and stick to their times, but that's one of those times that Teddy Hart and Jack Evans and that fucking crew had got sideways somewhere, who knows, at a crack house or whatever the fuck, and came in late, and he told them that they were, had missed their match, so they went out and did some kind of routine where they took a bunch of bumps anyway, and then it started snowing. And so now the show had gone long, and it's snowing outside in New York, and a lot of these people, because it's New York, they use public transportation. <laughs> And they're wanting to get the fuck out of there. And then Aries and Tyler Black are going an hour. So if they do the same thing, I'm not going to say it's going to snow in San Francisco. But if they do the the what they always do, and Tony lets all these jack-offs masturbate to themselves and indulge themselves with these 30-minute marathons, and then they put an hour match in the ring at 11 o'clock local time, it might not work out. And they got to be aware of that. Well, Jim, another banner episode of AEW Dynamite. Before we get to the ratings, I got to ask you, what do you think of this show and specifically the last couple of episodes and this show as lead-ins and the go-home show to this pay-per-view event? You know, well, they're not focused in any way on a normal basis, but in this case... They're not focused uh, on, I don't know what. It's the old Sputnik Monroe story when all the guys in the Memphis locker room and Jarrett and they're all sitting there going, you know, we just don't understand these pafos, the outlaws that are fucking with us, you know. And Jerry said, I just don't understand how stupid people think. And then Sputnik jumped up and said, well, hell, Jerry, I'll tell you how they think. And then realized what he'd done and sat back down. I don't know what Tony's thinking. But there is a unique situation here with both of these companies. Before we even go into the AEW ratings, before we even go into talking about the WWE television, both companies have created the market for the other company. Because as as when we talk about, uh, ever talk about the WWE programs, we say, well, they'll talk you to death. They'll talk you the entrances. They'll talk you these long, dramatic, you know, theater and the round promos in the ring. They'll talk you on the packages in the backstage. And when they do get to a match, you know, they'll give you a minute and a half, they'll go to the break, or in the case of Raw's three hours, they'll give you the same fucking teams, the same guys endlessly in the first segment. So the you know, you get your fill of them for the month and one night. But the matches have become secondary, less important, and also they all look the same because so many of the guys have such 
either ridiculous personas act in these unnatural ways or are being made to be thespians uh, that you you tune out and it's all the same kind of sounding shit except for the top guys. And that's why the bloodline story has gotten so over. And that's why the guys like Sammy and Owens who can talk and Cody, they can, they fit in that environment, but they can talk and produce in the ring. And so therefore they stand out Brock because he's real, but so the hundred and 70 whatever other people on the roster are often interchangeable and it doesn't have to be that way but they've created the environment where yeah every once in a while we'll break out into a match and it'll be professionally done for the most part instead if 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 flop dollars not involved because they're all highly trained but you're not that interested and in the other company they don't talk you to death because most of these guys are afraid to stand in front of a fucking microphone and a camera because they've spent their entire careers doing it in a goddamn locker room in front of a VHS or a camera or somebody's phone or in their basement. So they don't like to talk. So that's why the guys that can talk in AEW get over strong and also because in AEW they're allowed to be more of themselves because while Tony apparently micromanages this goddamn fantasy universe of action figure booking he's got going on he'll let the guys talk like themselves and that benefits the small percentage that can talk it it handicaps the others that need fucking direction the matches that their fans they love the matches because wwe's boring is fucking watching piss dry but the matches our goddamn chaos constantly with no rules, no parameters, no meaning, no logic doesn't register. It's just people that like to watch car crashes and it fucking flies by you. And the injury rate is through the roof and it's every indie wrestlers wet dream to go and do stuff like that on TV. And there's a reason why most of them are, were never allowed to before, but you never know what you're going to see on AEW television. Whereas in the booking in the WWE, it's predictable, You except for the bloodline, which is why it's over. You pretty much know what's going to happen, where they're going, the format of the show. Well, we know that somebody's going to walk out here, and then they're going to have a match, and a blah, 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 because it's the same, same, same. AEW, the booking, you never know what's going to happen, because it doesn't make any fucking sense. It's just pulled out of a hat. That's one of the problems. I mean... There are a lot of problems, but I think this is one of the deepest problems. Tony truly believes that his stories connect, that these programs, these feuds, the ins and outs of them are connecting with people. And last week's rating, as we said earlier, gave him, I think, a false boost <laughs> in believing that when it was clear it was a fluke rating. But when the booker truly believes that their stuff is really good and it's not, and there's no one there that's going to say that to him, because he's not going to want to hear it. He's not going to believe it. It's a tough situation to be in. You know, no matter who you want to imagine's there that could talk to Tony Khan, that's a bad conversation. Because who's going to say, Tony, look, I really like you. I care about you. I consider you a friend. This is not going well right now. You need to step back and be the executive producer, but let someone else handle the actual television booking. He's going to get very defensive. He's going to point to various websites and message boards that love what he's doing. And he's going to try to justify his booking. And he owns the company. So it's a very tricky situation going okay, forward. Okay, hold on. They're three and a half years in, right? Uh, give or take, yeah. 2019. 2019, yeah. Yeah, okay. So in another three and a half years, let's say at the, the seven-year itch, if somebody, if, if, if Tony keeps a aneurysm free for another three and a half years, then at seven years, would he entertain the idea of somebody coming to him and say, Tony, now it's been seven fucking years. Rod Serling didn't write every episode of The Twilight Zone. What are you trying to fucking prove it? What, what is the cutoff date? When do, would Tony say, okay, at, at, at this, the, even the quantity, just if nobody is looking at the quality or lack thereof or adjudicating same, 
just the quantity of what Tony Khan would have booked in terms of hours of television and the fucking YouTube and the dark and the pay-per-view and the battle of the belts and the chase to cat that ate the rat. If somebody said after five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, how long does he expect to do that before somebody said, you know, Tony, fucking hell, Shakespeare didn't write this much. Somebody at some point is going to have to take over this. And so you just wonder when it'll be for him. Whenever the, what is his blood pressure currently? We could have a pool on the blood pressure. Go ahead. And we don't know where he'll be in seven years. Will things get crazier <laughs> with the football team, with the soccer team? Will he have a family of his own? You know what I mean? Like there's lots of things that happen in these years that would make the schedule even crazier. He knows wrestling history. Jared and Lawler, it made sense for them both mentally to switch on and off as Booker. Would you say well, that's and, correct? Well, yes, and also, and Bill Dundee got in that rotation. Right. And, and again, but think about this. If you just want to use that as an example, Jerry Jarrett was booking his company in 77 from the time he started it until, I think Lawler had some input starting in, especially in his programs, starting at the same time and maybe a little bit more in 78, but really Jarrett handed off after a year and a half or two years to I know a year and a half to Robert Fuller for a few months. That didn't work out. Jarrett took it back. And then after such and such, uh, I think maybe was it another year and a half? I think that's the first time Dundee got involved. And then Dundee had nine months and then there was a power play or a year and there was power play with Lawler. Lawler got it back. And then they switched. They, but the point is Bill Watts, Eddie Graham, name great bookers throughout history. Nobody did not only everything every week for uninterrupted periods of three, four, five, six years. Can you think of anyone? Even even Roy Shire, who was somewhat of the control freak that an uncouth Bill Watts, if that's possible, he did everything, uh, but still had people helping him in the form of Ray Stevens, Pat Patterson with ideas and things like that. And, and it that's was with simpler. less TV and the need for less angles yeah. and no big pay-per-views. So, I mean, it was a completely exactly. different system. They wouldn't burn out as fast. But, but no, I mean, so it's not like that, that great bookers, you know, just did this for unlimited amounts of time steadily. They went here and back and forth. And Jared had that flurry in, in, uh, of course, he booked Memphis for years before that, but that was the the town that he was not the promoter, Nick and Roy, and there he didn't have as many responsibilities. And then there was a period there for a while, as we talked about, where he was booking Atlanta and Memphis. But he he that was a period of a year and a half or whatever. He couldn't keep that up indefinitely. If Ole Anderson was in a simpler time again, was booking in Georgia and the Carolinas at one point at the same time, but not for fucking years. So and not anyway. necessarily well <laughs> at all times, too. Well, you know, back in the 70s, everything did. See, that's the thing. When he Only booked both at the same time, I'm talking about. It, well, no, you're thinking about the 80s. There's yeah. periods in the 70s that it, it did do well. It, it, see, that's the thing. Only did well until he didn't do well. People forget that and in the seventies, that's when he was actually at his best. And, and that's, maybe that's another example, just because you can do shit for 10 or 15 years, doesn't mean you can do it for another 10 or 15. See, the thing is Tony has ring of honor and he should probably go book that and do what he can to really help that right now. Be the executive producer of AEW. I know he loves having all of his roles put out there in every press release, the GM and the creative <laughs> director and the owner and the founder and this and that be the executive producer of AEW. Not saying step back from everything, but don't run TV and don't have anything to do with creative. Give it six months. Give it a year. Now, the issue is who you hand it off to. There are no easy answers there, and I don't think a committee would make any sense, even though AEW in a lot of ways has been pitching to Tony by committee. So I don't know who that person yeah, is, but... but the, the, when the, the committee pitches, the, the funnel is very important, where it all drips down in the same bottle, and, and Tony's got a bunch of holes in his funnel. 
All right, but having said that, the point I was going to make there, and now we'll go on to the original topic, was each one of these companies, as I illustrated with just some of the differences, has created the market for each other. AEW is the people who say, fuck the WWE, it's boring. There's no car crashes, there's no silly indie-rific characters, and there's no goddamn action. At least over here, there's action. It's just all unprofessional and fucking chaotic, but there's action. And the other, the WWE fans, actually, I don't know that AEW created them otherwise than maybe ran them back off when a few of them sampled the taste of the menu because Punk was involved. But they, obviously, the WWE fans want to see the stars that they perceive to be stars and the big production and the stadiums and the glory and the glamour and the glitz. And they look at, the you know roster over on the other side is well, what these are kids or fucking what is this like the b league or d team or whatever so i don't know what to tell you let's what so here's the big question after we spent so much time discussing that woeful program and milking what the numbers were going to be we now i believe brian last you have the numbers <laughs> That's that's the drum roll I got there. That sucked, but yes, indeed. Wait a minute, we hold have the on. Numbers. Do I have another drum? Hold on, please. There we go. Ta-da! Eight hundred and thirty-three thousand viewers this week for AEW Dynamite, March first. Ouch! And that was down what from last week? Oh, last week was a million average, wasn't it? A, a little, uh, just a few over a million, so down about one hundred and seventy. 5,000 or whatever, but quarter by quarter, where did we stand? Well, these were compiled by Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. 8 to 8.15 p.m., Orange Cassidy versus Big Bill <laughs> with Picture in Picture, 948,000 viewers. Ooh, so they were down at the start. I wonder, you know what? Oh, Brandon, he ought to start giving us the last quarter hour of the Big Bang so we know where we started. I'd also like to see the next quarter hour after the show ends for all these shows. That'd be interesting, too. Well, we, we soon will because they'll have that, too, with their reality program. Quarter 2, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m., the finish of Orange Cassidy versus Big Bill, John Moxley's backstage promo, and the beginning of the face of the revolution ladder match 892,000 viewers ouch so pockets managed to lose them 56,000 people in the first 15 minutes well the next 15 minutes 8:30 to 8:45 p.m. segment 3 the ladder match continued as well as the post boy did it as well as the it post went on and on and on as well as the post match angle with wardlow and then orange cassidy and danhausen's <laughs> backstage promo 894,000 viewers oh so the 2000 people wandered in by accident i have to think if you started that ladder match you may stick with it just to see if anyone was going to die <sighs> I thought Action Andretti broke his leg or was about to break his leg at one point. But let's well, go. yeah, well, whoever was giving him that thing also, well, who was it, Sammy? Just lost. Yeah, yeah They just so. went down on the, they dropped onto the lower ladder and then fell in a heap. Well, speaking of dropping and falling in a heap, segment four, Chris Jericho, uh, excuse me, 8.45 to 9 p.m., Chris Jericho versus Peter Avalon. <sighs> as well as the post-match angle with Ricky Starks and the Jericho Appreciators, the Hangman Page backstage promo, the Christian Cage live promo, and the Jungle Boy Jack Perry video. Boy. 836,000 viewers. Ouch. Okay, that I can't do math this large in my head. 58,000 more people decided to go wash their hair. This show is a perfect example of how to run people off. Segment 5, 9 to 9.15 p.m., the 9 o'clock hour, Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker's backstage promo, Hook versus Matt Hardy, <clears throat> the House of Black's backstage promo, as well as the beginning of Riho versus Tony Storm, 
803,000 viewers. Another 33,000. Another one bites the dust. No bump from the 9 o'clock hour. No bump at all. Nothing. No. (laughs) Well, there was a bump, all right. They hit a bump in the road and some shit fell off the truck. Every week there's a bump at 9 o'clock. Nothing here this week for this. But 9.15 and 9.30 p.m., segment six, the continuation of Riho versus Tony Storm with picture and picture, Mm. as well as the post-match angle with Hayter, Baker, Soraya, and Soho. The Keith Lee and Dustin Rhodes backstage promo. (laughs) And the beginning of the Casino Tag Team Battle Royal. What a show this is. Jesus. 776,000 viewers. Oh, there goes another uh, 27,000. And we are down now from the start. Let's see, 124, 160, 172,000 from the start of this program have bailed out and decided they'd take their chances with the Sharks. Segment 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., a continuation of the Tag Team Battle Royal with Picture in Picture, 781,000 viewers. Ooh, well, that, were they coming back thinking there was going to be a main event? Maybe they were coming back thinking this has to be over by now. <laughs> so they got 5,000 back. And finally, segment eight, 9.45 to 10 p.m., the last four minutes of the Battle Royal. That went through three segments. Yeah. The post-match with the Acclaimed and Jarrett and Lethal. And finally, the MJF Brian Danielson video and confrontation. 736,000 viewers. For the only thing on this program that means money on that pay-per-view. Buried at the end of this program after nothing but stuff that if you wrote it on paper, you would have to see that it would only hold your most hardcore fan. It's a bad show. And, and, the, and they, had, they had to wait till five minutes till yeah. to see that segment that you were just talking about. I said earlier that you know, MJF has done too much in this feud with Danielson, and I think part of it is he has to overcompensate for Danielson just not being the right guy for him. I also think he has to overcompensate for the booking. Since he's been champion, look at what these shows have been, up and down. It's terrible. I can't do this math, but maybe you can. They started, they finished with 212,000 fewer people than they started. And since they started with 948,000, that's somewhere around 20% or more, right? It's more than 20%. It's 22 or 23. They lost 23% of the audience or something like that over the course of this fiasco. You are pretty good at math. I will trust your... Uh, I'm just, I was just eyeballing it. And it, it, either you eyeball it or free ball it, one or the other. You can get close enough. But all right. Ah, hey, just so you ah. know, because uh, there's a couple other things here that Brendan Thurston did say. Compared to the last week, Dynamite was down 19% in total viewership. Among viewers 18 to 49, it was down 22% from last week. NBA games were back on ESPN, unlike last week when there was an all-star break. So there's some information in terms of the difference between last week and this week. I, I fail to think that there's that many... NBA fans, 200,000, well, from last week, 270-something thousand of them that suddenly, oh, I got to go watch this game again. I'll never watch that wrestling program I watched last week again. Something else is going, again, the, the, the shows are coming home to roost. Well, here's the other thing. If you know you have a week unopposed by the NBA because of the All-Star break, if you know there's a chance you'll get whatever the amount is, 10%. 100,000 people, whatever it is, you got people that potentially will be watching your show that don't traditionally. That's the show you make your selling point. <laughs> That's the show that you really get people interested in the product and the wrestlers, and they want to come back and see. I have to see what's going to happen next week. There was nothing on last week's show. No, that you would know have sold what? You. Yeah, there you go. I think that Tony thinks he did that last week. And that's why we got pockets this week in. Two, three, parts of six different segments. Or at least five of the Battle Royal, the fucking two-segment match, and the fucking promo in the back. 
He thinks pockets drew him a house. It drives me crazy how many people know better, how many people will say it privately, but how many people won't publicly say Tony is not a good booker. And he really wants to do it. And he's made money with AEW. AEW has made money, whether it's a profit or not is another story, but AEW's made money. It's been a successful operation, but booking is not his thing. And everyone knows it. And there's a lot of people afraid to say it. People there are afraid to say it. I can understand that. But there's a lot of other people that just don't want to hurt his feelings. It's not about his feelings. It's business. It's the truth. He's not good at this. <laughs> But there are people still pretending. Can you imagine if if all the rotten actors and actresses that have gotten into movie business over the years, if somebody, well, they're the shits, but put them in that movie. We don't want to hurt their feelings. No, if this was the case, it would be the worst Uh. actor ever financing his own movie that he would be the director of and the executive producer of and the key grip and the best boy. Tell me he'll do all the roles. (laughs) Hey, now don't be flog the image of the best boy. That's a tough job and thankless. I remember years ago in the Shimanaki Post, they had a, I forget what, I forget now what it was. It was some kind of fake movie ad making fun of WCW, but I think by the end of it, it had like the different cast members in their things and it said, Key Grips and Best Boys, Pat Patterson. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that might be a segue 